Thank you. Uh, I will be speaking on the higher curvature extension Einstein's theory. So, the basic idea is uh, to understand gravity. And in order, in order to understand gravity, you need some heavy mathematics and also a doubt of physics. So, this, this area is actually a beautiful interplay between deep mathematics and uh, higher order physics also. In nature, there are four fundamental forces that are well known. Gravity is one of them, electromagnetism is another, then we have a strong nuclear force, a weak nuclear force. Of these uh, four forces in nature, the latter three are pretty well understood. There are some very good theories that explain them, and they are fairly well understood. Gravity, on the other hand, uh, doesn't enjoy that status. Uh, doubt what true theory of gravity is. The front runner by far is, however, there are some drawbacks to general relativity. And this is what I shall explain as we go along. Not to get deep, uh, but just to explain that we need general relativity to be supplemented and to be improved on. So far, general relativity is ideal. Okay, for so-called local level, on a much grander, bigger scale, central density does have some uh, features that are not desirable. So that's how we work around that. So, to understand gravity, first we have to point out that in the classical understanding of gravity, as we know from Sir Isaac Newton, gravity there is understood to be a but in the general theory of relativity, gravity has to be a, an effect of curvature of space time. In other words, gravity is a geometric effect, not a, uh, something like a force. Therefore, we need the uh, tools of Ramanian geometry and surface theory to understand uh, the inner working gravitational field. Uh, some of the elements of mathematics and which have been developed, some of these things the specific purpose of understanding general relativity, the notion of uh, parallel transport. How do you move a vector field from one place in a space to another place along a set curve to try to keep the vectors parallel to each other? What is the mathematical requirements for that to happen? Then we will need some aspects of uh, the idea of metrics and the connection which makes this parallel transport possible. So, maybe we should start with the basic elements of the mathematics of uh, Let's start off with an understanding of vector space. So, at the outset, let me distinguish between two types of vectors, contravariant vectors and covariance. These words were used by the test in 1863. Basically, the idea is that contravariant vectors need transform them from one place to another, or use a different basis for the vector space, then the components, the coefficients, they generate a matrix. This matrix transforms in such a way that uh, in the transformed case is the inverse is required. Therefore, we say these vectors transformations are such that they contra On the other hand, if the components transform standard way, they remain uh, consistent, then we say that they are covariant things. Now let me define uh, what we call a dual space. If you have a vector space P, it can be of n dimensions. You define a dual space P star. The dual space is a class of linear functionals that tap onto the real space. So the vectors in T star are all covariant vectors. Some of these are dealt with in our honors course. I'm going to details, but we actually move to the past. Now that we have understood the concept of a vector space, we now build more heavy machinery. Let's build a tensor space. So a tensor product is a C with itself of a set of bilinear functions on T. 
theta. The equal theta is the dual space of theta. Instead of linear by func uh, functional, by linear functionals and theta because theta generates a tensor product. And likewise, we can find the tensor product of T with theta, theta with itself, and so on. This allows us to then uh, in the form T, this as TAB. TAB is from the basis vector space. Basis. Camera is also could be visible. This allows us to introduce a transformation law. If vectors transform like this, TA dash, D dash, and the other side component, this represents component matrices. If this transformation works according to that uh, speed, then such an object is called tensor. So not every object within this speed, TAB or TAB with the lower speed, is necessarily a tensor. It has to obey tensor transformation law. In general, this is what the general transformation law looks like. Now the importance of tensors in the entire game is that uh, when we use tensors, a tensor equation is invariant under the change of coordinates or bases. That's a massive advantage. So you don't want to have a... See, at the end of the game, you down some differential equations. You want these differential equations. In other words, it should be independent of what bases you choose, what coordinates you choose. Now, Tensors allow us to achieve that. The equations are invariant. Now, a Riemannian manifold is endowed with a metric tensor. This is the principal tensor in the entire game. KP. So this is the, from a basis KAP in the following form us to define concepts such as length and angle. So the length can be defined in the following way, and the angle of the speed to can be defined in the following way. Cos theta, it's like a dot product of ordinary vectors, but now we're dealing with tensor spaces, much more elaborate and complex. So as I mentioned, we need the money and commentary. We can't uh, live completely in a Euclidean space. However, Riemannian manifold is going to be locally Euclidean. Locally Euclidean. So, so uh, something like a color bar is uh, a good example of a differentiable manifold. So it has, uh, it's quite smooth, well -being. Pumpkin might not qualify because it's not differentiable. So therefore, pumpkin may not be a good example of a differentiable manifold, although it's a manifold. Now we are ready to define an object called the line element. The measure of distance in a manifold. So the distance is defined in terms of the metric density GAB and these infinitesimal uh, TXA, TXB. Now we have a concept of uh, distance. Don't be so concerned with the concept of uh, angle for now to us in the direction that we are going to be taking later on. So we have what is called the fundamental theorem of money and geometry. I'll skip all the heavy mathematical stuff here. Yeah? However, you should pay attention to this object here, yeah, MIA. This is known as the metric connection. So to transport a vector or a vector field point on a, a to another point in the map along a certain curve. And if you want to keep that vector field parallel to itself, then obviously this can't be done in a linear way. We need an object called a metric connection. The object gamma ABC serves that purpose. It allows us to transport parallel to themselves along a set. So I will now proceed to define this. Well, before I get to the metric connection itself, let me define the calculus that we are going to be using. We define an object or a process called a covariant derivative noted by the semicolon. PA semicolon C. 
that's defined as VA, comma, C, comma, I mean the part. Ordinary system. A is the gamma ABC, the metric connection that allows us to perform a particular loop and uh, times a certain vector EP. Now we can write this metric connection in terms of the metric tensor. So gamma ABC can be written in terms of half GAT, GCD, comma B, blah, 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 blah. So what you should notice here, especially for those of us that are not working in relativity, you might not be familiar with what we call the Einstein summation convention. What that means is that on the left hand we have ABC as symbols. On the right hand side we also have A, B, and C as A, B, C. So if you want components gamma 1, 1, 1, then on the right hand side A, B, C will be 1, 1, 1. But then see symbols like D, right hand side, something which doesn't exist. That means you have to sum. Uh, across that symbol. So in the in our work here, we are working in a four-dimensional space. We will be summing over four four space space directions and uh, one time coordinate. So it will be D. In other words, summing over north, one, two, and three. Some textbooks use one, two, three, four, but we will use not one, two, and three. Sum over. So you will sum. Not as innocent as it looks. Get the, get the sum in this calculation. Now, when we teach the cross TR, explain that the way this is done, the, the way we get this is that we demand covariant derivative at the tensor in scale. This way this allows us to define things in that derivative of the metric tensor to be zero, and then to work backwards to make those definitions. Now we have the machinery. We have a metric tensor, and we have the mechanism to move vectors from one place to another in a manner. Now, I'll pause briefly to talk about special relativity. That's not really our discussion here. But in special relativity, the big mistake is that there is no gravity. Special relativity does not take into the text of the gravitational field. So, in special relativity, isometries we use this here, the Lorentz group transformation to serve uh, the interval between events. So, if an interval takes place two hours later, the interval length of the metric. The interval, uh, the, the event to some other point, the manifold, uh, the interval length will remain the same. If you include translations, then we require the full Poincare equation of n degrees of freedom in Minkowski, Minkowski space. So there, everything is Minkowskian. Gravity involved. In contrast, in Newtonian physics, we simply require Galilean transformations. They act on absolute space and time. No push as we have here in the Poincare equation. So that's relativity and special relativity. Special relativity has no gravity effect. You may say the game is much easier there, even though it's very interesting. So now let's uh, double in uh, the real game of general relativity. And uh, we now introduce static curves to the Recall that we are working in a, actually, it's not actually a Riemannian manifold, a pseudo Riemannian manifold. That's because uh, we have a minus sign in metric somewhere along the line. I'll expose that later on. But let me firstly build on the, uh, the tools we need. By far the most important tool, important object in the entire theory, is this guy, the Riemannian tensor. The Riemannian tensor, you can see, is connection and derivative. Yeah, also product. There's a very complicated animal with about uh, 120 of the components. But thankfully, it has a number of symmetry properties in here in these uh, indices. So, on account of its symmetry, it generally boils down to 24 unique components. 
So this is quite a formidable object. This object holds the entire geometry of space time. So it tells us the whole story about geometry. The Ricci tensor. The Ricci tensor is a contraction of the Riemann. You see, there's a rep repetition here. Contraction hit this component C here, and then the object simplifies to that. Then we perform a further contraction of the trace of Ricci scale, which is the GAB tensor upper RAB, which is the Ricci tensor. For those that are not schooled in this topic, uh, the distinction between upper indices and lower indices. The metric tensor allows us to raise and lower indices in the entire game. The time doesn't allow us to reach all the details of that, uh, the way that operates. Finally, we come down to the Einstein tensor. This tensor was constructed by Einstein himself. GAB equals to RAB minus half R GAB. So it has Ricci uh, tensor. It has the scalar and the metric tensor here. Yeah. And there's a half that's required here. Yeah. Historically, before I go into the history, one of the sensor nowadays is topical. You may have heard recently that uh, gravitational wave exercise. In February, in 2016, there was an announcement of the discovery of gravitational waves by a team of researchers that worked on a project called LIGO. This year, in 2017, the Nobel Prize in physics was awarded to So, the uh, reason why I mentioned wild tensor is because wild tensor is actually composed from the Riemann tensor. Riemann tensor can be decomposed by wild tensor. We also call it the conformal curvature. And other parts involve the Ricci tensor and curvature scale. The wild tensor itself can be neatly split up into two parts an electric part and a magnetic part. And, and uh, it is then quite important to theory of gravitational waves. I won't go into the theory at all because, frankly, uh, I don't understand uh, the final points there. But uh, uh, we have a concept of uh, a space. But also the wild tensor, when the wild tensor is zero, speak of it being a conformal, formally invariant. Space time is formally invariant. In other words, there's a, a homotopy exists from one one space time to another. So in, the, in such cases, homotopic transformation leaves it invariant. So it's called we say that the wild tensor vanishes. So if you've heard of uh, conformal invariance, now coming back to the history, Einstein postulated these field equations. So these field equations humbly look like this: CAB equals CAB. Doesn't actually look very spectacular, but uh, well, the, the Einstein tensor, I just defined it like that. And you may recall the definition of RAB, R, and the GAB. If I had to write all of this out in detail, then it would really look quite spectacular. So that's heavy mathematics involved in this. Now, the, the way Einstein achieved this, uh, Einstein tensor, was uh, you see on the right hand side, left hand side, GAB is simple geometry. It's actually mathematics. Left hand side is math. Simply geometry. The right hand side T is called the uh, uh, energy momentum tensor. An energy momentum tensor encapsulates this. You have to say what kind of physics you have there. What kind of a fluid do you have? Do you have a dust? In this case, there's no pressure. Do you have a uh, static? Do you have a charged fluid? Do you have a, uh, a radiation fluid? That's where you insert that object on the right hand side. That's now, we know there's a famous uh, law of energy conservation. You want to conserve the energy, then this boils down in our language. 
having this physics, the energy moment in terms of the divergence CAB semicolon. This places a constraint on the right hand scale. So you want to define a tensor on the left hand side in such a way that the divergence is also zero. That's how Einstein gets up on this form, using that kind of thinking. And they finally, after several hits and misses, came upon this form, now known as Einstein tensor. And these equations above are known as Einstein field equations. But uh, as it turns out, and follow a completely different uh, approach to the Einstein equation. Uh, if you use the Lagrangian approach, for example, many of you are familiar with that, and define the Lagrangian appropriately, then you can obtain Einstein's field equation independent using the Euler Lagrange equation. So the Einstein equations can be corroborated that way, but I have just explained how Einstein himself in the early 1900s. Now, it's a famous remark. Einstein said that the left hand side of the equation, the palace of gold, is mathematics law. The right hand side, he said, is a hovel of wood. That's where the big speculation is. The left hand side is fairly well known and well studied. Mathematics. But the right hand side is where you can now insert or inject physics. And indeed, inject your own speculative ideas to see what comes up in the Einstein field equation. So, here are the Einstein field equations. If you want to invoke a, an electromagnetic field, then you insert an electromagnetic field tensor. And then you have to couple that. These are the Maxwell's equations that have to be. So, the Maxwell's equations of a tensor of SAB. And we need the concept A for current. So then we can define these objects, the electromagnetic field tensor EAB, in terms of uh, the Faraday tensor FAB, and it also includes the. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is how you develop the uh, electromagnetic field contribution. All right, now we are going into the Einstein field equation. This is where differential equations experts, such as I see two sitting in the audience here, may now want to jump on into the bandwagon here because from here onwards, we can actually start making a good living without knowing what happened before this. But uh, you can see this quite considerable heavy lifting of mathematics was involved to bring us to this stage. All right, so now let's, let's unpack the Einstein's field equations. So we start off, we need the certain uh, geometry. So we define a metric in this form, spherically symmetric, P squared to uh, something where, oh yes, notice the minus here. This is why we get through the minus. We need the Lorentz transformation to work for the minus. Part. Anyway, uh, dt squared is a time contribution, time direction. Pr squared is radial direction. And this part here is what is called the true sphere. So this is a, you can see it's a four-dimensional space-time uh, metric. Then we also need to define uh, some physics in the form of the, the velocity. The velocity field defined as ua plus e to the minus mu, Kronecker delta from naught to a. It ensures that only one component is driving. From that you can generate the Einstein's field equations. So when you write out the field equations, oh, remember it was PAB equals PAB and left hand side and all the geometric parts, left hand side. Right hand side has the energy moment side of it. The main objects in the energy momentum tensor are the density rho and the pressure is a the radial pressure PPR, which I shall denote as P. On the left hand side, we've got the metric component. So the entire game is to figure out what these components are. When you solve the system of potential equations, the game 
get victims to close down. So there are actually four items in this. There's mu and lambda, geometry. And then we have rho and uh, p. Well, he, actually there's five, pr and pc. But generally we invoke what your pressure. We extensively, sorry, the pressure and the radial and tangential direction. When you equate these two, then you equate those two. That forms a skewed equation. The differential equation involves Q's and lambda. And you can see that it's highly nonlinear. For example, you can see the new dash squared. Q dash lambda nonlinear you will find it derived. And you can play the game with that equation as you like. If you want to include the maximum field, in other words, the electricity, then you have these terms added on. The E here is the electrostatic field. And you'll see I have dropped the PR and the theta because I'm going to assume I thought it your pressure from here on. You don't assume I thought uh, I thought it your pressure. Then it's actually a very uninteresting game because basically three field equations. But if you have electricity involved, then there's four field equations items to work out. It means that you can choose two things. If you just go back here, you will see that you can express the density, pressure, radial pressure, and tangential pressure in terms of mu and lambda completely, which is on a very trivial level. If you just pick a metric, just any function here, we don't have t here because that's the case, right? But if you just pick random functions here, you can then easily work out rho, pr, and t theta. There's actually no interesting game to display. So it's trivial. That's why sometimes they need that uh, any metric solves and equations for that reason. If you put in the electric field, it makes it a little more complicated. In some sense, it actually becomes. Easier. I'll explain that as we go along. There are many to solve all kinds of an equation. So if you look on trivial case of isotropy of pressure, then there are actually very few exact solutions to know. True, there is there are about 120 solutions known for just the state of case. Of those, only about 16 are known physically worthwhile. Even a smaller subset of about eight. Are known to be actually realistic, that they could represent the realistic celestial domain. So the system is under the system, as I said. Therefore, it opens up the room for ad hoc. If you want to make it more complicated, if you want to really invoke serious physics, then you may have to invoke what we call an equation of state. So, recall we have the density. And the possessions. One condition of isotropy is interest. But that still gives you three equations in one of them. You have one freedom to choose something of a system. If you in any being say linearly dependent on the density, then you choke more. Then become inverted. Move. Technically, in this case now, if you add on one more condition, the system is completely determined. But now you are completely nothing to do. You can't move. There's no way to solve. The general solution is not known in this very simple case. So then there are variations in trying to simplify it. Again. You can invoke some mathematical methods. I have done it in some of my papers. You may find where I have used uh, methods of Basically, here, if you know a solution, trivial solution, or a solution that is different, you can use conformal geometry to generate a solution of Einstein's equations, the free scatter, the way the killing vectors transform, and so on, trust solution from old solutions, for defective solutions. So the new 
solutions can be have some under a conformal mapping. Conformal mapping is of the type uh, GAP equals to E U a U type of U. So this is the conformal factor U, and this factor U can be a function of E R theta phi. Trivial. And it's a homotopic transformation. In that case, it's trivial. Now, the components I defined early on the uh, metric, uh, the uh, connection coefficients, the Riemann tensor, the tensor, and the Ricci scalar, all transform from these rules. So they're quite complicated. So you may then write the Einstein tensor in a conformally related manner. I'm not going to go into the details. Now coming back to exact solutions, what we know so far. So if you work in the vacuum, in other words, outside some closed object, where there's no pressure and density, right hand side is pretty zero, CAB is zero, then we expect the left hand side, RAB. Or, or, in fact, if you like the CAB, then you can solve the field equations there. But this boils down to just one equation to find. So, in history, we have many solutions known. Torshaw produced the first exterior metric. If you add on charge, 1918, Reisner Nordstrom produced such a solution. Then, several years later, if you add on radiation, sorry, if you just take a radiating field by itself, exterior, in the vacuum, so the vacuum, the space is not empty anymore, with radiation. And 1051 PC by their found that solution. In 1963, Roy Kerr found what is called rotating case. And that's the most realistic case, rotating case, because uh, in general, we know celestial objects are not stationary, they rotate, such as pulsars, for example. For each of these solutions now, we need to ask what is the interior? In the case of the Schwarzschild exterior, what metric solves the interior? They have a perfect clue, say, for example, on the inside. What is the metric uh, on the inside? So we try to find an interior metric. And that, that is the GAB equals CAB equation I was telling you about. You can list any kind of CAB on the right hand side and try to solve it. That's the effective game. So we know solutions for, for the Schwarzschild metric. An interior metric. We know that's not strong, not strong interior metrics. We even know Vidya is it. But the curve metric, after today, more than 50 years later, no metric, interior metric has been found that matches exterior curve metric. So that's a cornerstone problem in general that finds such an interior metric. That will then unlock our understanding of how stars, other spinning rotational objects. In the uh, in general the relativity, what complicates the problem is you have the concept of frame dragging. When an object is rotating, it doesn't just rotate; the frame doesn't stop. The rotating object drags the frame. So the mathematics of that is not clearly understood. This is a clear example where the mathematics hasn't caught up. So until the thematics is in place, the problem is to be quite elusive. Now, so what all the answers, in fact, our business is find exact Why are these exact solutions? Well, if you find an exact solution, then the game really starts. And you can use the exact solution to model compact stuff. So you can say that an exact solution can help you to set up a a lab to understand some uh, high, highly compact gravity regimes and find uh, an equation of state governs the behavior of the interior of the object. And uh, you see things like mass radius relations. These things can actually be done experimentally. But the equation of state, what's happening inside, does it, no, it's not possible to tell what's happening inside a, a sphere. So this. 
this is the reason why there is high importance. Even though people now, next best thing is a numerical solution. A numerical solution is severe in this system. A numerical solution will not tell us uh, all the complicated mathematics such as what the simplifications, if you make a simplification, what is the consequence later on in the game. That's why they are not so useful. Theories of gravity continue to theory. Ground theory popular, but it is recently F of one. They are very popular because they help to correct the massive shock, which is that general relativity predicts that the universe should be contracted, whereas the reality from experiments is the universe is expanding. Not only that, accelerating. General relativity has that effect. It doesn't predict expansion of the universe. Some of our theories have useful in that direction. Recently, they have been shown equivalent to scale attention. The problem with F of our theories, for our different uh, friends, is that they involve derivatives of higher order than two, the order of four. That makes the uh, game quite complicated from a purely mathematical point of view. So we also then have higher curvature gravity, such as what I am dabbing in right now. And uh, we can construct a theory of gravity that's second order. I'm using quadratic extensions of the uh, Riemann tensor, the Ricci tensor, and the Ricci scale. Such a theory was constructed by, or such a Lagrangian, to that way, Lagrangian, which is a basic element in, uh, in the physical theory, you need a certain action principle. Constructed by Lovelock, 1971. Lovelock was a student of Hanno Rune, who was a professor of mathematics at Kozulun Natal. Massive gravity and so on. Trace free gravity, I've written some papers recently. Topic, uh, uh, compact objects in gravity, but I won't speak on that for the time. I'm going to focus on EGB and Gauss Bonnet gravity. This modifies the Einstein theory, and uh, the reason why this is well motivated Gauss Bonnet term happens to appear seriously in superstring theory. Superstring theory and quantum theory are important to find a band unified theory, the theory of gravity, quantum world. That's the thing is not been found yet. So when we find some links with the two of them, so the gauss bonnet term appears, and importantly, the gauss bonnet term produces second order quasi linear equations. That's a major plus. It's the theory of gravity to have second order. Just um, like Newton's equation. You also want to recover ordinary Newton's equation with a valid local frame. To first order, Einstein Gauss Bonnet equation reduced to general relativity. It means that if you turn off the Gauss Bonnet effect, you are back to general relativity. So all the good things that we know about GR are not that same. Now there are many known results for Einstein Gauss Bonnet gravity. Vacuum solution was found in nineteen eighty five. And then various other things were learned. In 2010, the first uh, interior metric was found by Professor Edish and others. But uh, this is a constant density case. It turns out Schwarzschild metric, ordinary GR, carries through also in the higher dimension of the region. So it remains consistent. That was a uh, finding there. Let me just backtrack a bit. This is a standard Einstein Hilbert action where you have a Ricci scale like that, R, and this is uh, the metric tensor, the determinant of the metric tensor inside the spiral there, and then uh, the four volume element. We construct the element of the Much more dangerous animal. It has R to the power n, not just R. And this R to the n, Constructed in this way, these are quadratic terms in the Riemann tensor. 
quadratic they are products of these quadratic terms. This is a generalized Kronecker delta. So to do this by hand is actually quite heavy lifting mathematically. So I, fortunately, I've had some experience doing this by hand myself to understand the inner workings of it. Expand the level of action, then it expands like this. Now I stop up to second order. So here you find this term is a dust bonnet term. Yeah. This is just a constant, and this is the cosmological constant, right? If you set all the other guys to zero, then basically you have a cosmological constant problem, and no matter. So it's a vacuum energy. But if you go to second order, you have this more complicated term. I stop for any order. But this is the I'm going to use in our construction of X. So the gauss bonnet field equations are as high as follows. GAB, the ordinary Einstein bit, then you have a contribution here, and the energy momentum tensor. This HAB is called the length of, and you can see it's, and here we have the gauss bonnet tensor. Innocently there, if you expect, here's the third order expansion of the polynomial, you can see it's quite a formidable object. It has R cubed. So if we start off with a static spherically symmetric metric of that type, uh, define an energy, energy momentum tensor, perfect fluid, and that. Conservation laws give us another equation. It's not a new equation. This is a, an equation that can be used together with the field equations, but it's nothing new. You can move one of the field equations and substitute it with this, uh, this equation of energy. Also, also called the uh, hydrodynamic uh, equation. Here are the Einstein field equations now for the EGB equation. I've given it in three dimensions. These are the three main equations for the density, pressure, and the rate, uh, still pressure. I found it useful to use the coordinate transformation of this path, replacing the new and the lambda as follows. I'll explain the advantages of that later. Fuel pressure and the potential pressure, so that uh, I form an equation of pressure I possibly. So these two will be weak. So that is the master equation of pressure I suffer. And uh, this is where our differential equations friends can now jump on. And they can start to take a very healthy living out of studying this equation from here onwards without worrying about all the preambles of the last 22 minutes. So, the advantage of the coordinate transformation I introduced was that this is now linear in y. y double dot, y double dot, to y. And choose z. And then try to find the solution of this linear differential equation. So that's what I spent a lot of time recently on. There are physical conditions that you must introduce. So find a solution that's not good enough. Then you have all, all these boundary conditions to work with. Then you also have conditions on the pressure and density called the causality criterion, where the speed of sound cannot exceed the speed of light, and so on. There are many energy conditions. There's not a, a free run even if you find it. So I've done some of these. Uh, I found three solutions so far myself. They are reported here in the literature. One in EPJC, one in PRD, and one in IJ and PDT. But those are the only three known solutions so far, as far as we know. We are still spending time trying to find new solutions for that. And recently, my collaborator, Naresh Gerdes, and I have conjectured that the best of pure laptop part by itself, leaving out the summation, can be a source of a gravitational field. Oh. So we have written some papers uh, on that here the recent. So those are a little simpler equations, but uh, they, they are complicated by themselves. I'll skip all of this here in view of the time, but these things are found in the literature. I just wanted to point out that in einstein gauss theory, only the dimension 5 and 6 
in four. No other dimensions are four. In dimensions three and four, we get back to the Einstein case. Dimensions five and six, plus made them comes alive. Dimensions seven onwards replicate five and six. And you prove five and six. So I'll stop here.